I'm Mike Domino. I'm a professor at the Widener Commonwealth Law School and the chairman of the Federalist Society's Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group, which is sponsoring this panel. The practice groups are uh, organized by substantive area of law, and each group has an executive committee that is comprised of volunteers who meet monthly by conference call. They direct the efforts of the practice group and they organize events including teleforum calls, in-person events, and panels such as this one at the National Convention. First, a, a housekeeping matter. Attendees seeking CLE credit are required to sign in each day. If you have not already done so, use the QR code on the CLE card that is provided. If you don't have the card, there are volunteers in the room with extra cards. And the QR code is also posted outside the room on the easel. Be advised, some states require attendees to sign out as well. And a final preliminary note, per DC regulations, please wear a mask unless you are eating or drinking. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's panel, Judge David Strauss. He's a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, where he has served since 2018. Prior to that time, Judge Strauss served as an associate justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. And before that, he was a professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, where he taught federal courts, constitutional law, criminal law, and law and politics. I have been a great admirer of Judge Strauss's for many years. I'm delighted that he is willing to moderate this panel, and I'm delighted to watch it. So please join me in welcoming Judge Strauss. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for coming. Uh, what a great panel we have ahead of us. I'm going to take, so I've been doing this for a long time. I think this is my 13th or 14th straight convention or something like that. And rarely as moderator do I talk about experiences that I've had uh, over the course of time. But I think that maybe one of the reasons why I was asked to moderate this panel is I've had some recent experiences that are quite interesting. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. And maybe it'll set the foundation uh, for what we'll be talking about as a panel. So for those of you who paid attention to the little blue pamphlet, in there it talks about this panel, and here's what it says. The Supreme Court said in 1964 that there's a profound national commitment to the principle the debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. As one might well guess, and, and Mike talked about my background, despite being a former law professor myself, uh, my views and judicial opinions are probably not considered orthodox in the halls of academic institutions today. So recently I accepted an invitation to speak from the Duke Federalist Society, and it was actually co-sponsored by the school through their career services office. The topic was my grandparents' experiences in the Holocaust and what they taught me about the First Amendment. Never did I imagine that a speech about the Holocaust would result in a protest. Yet, midway through my talk, when I started discussing one of my 2018 decisions, First Amendment decisions, Telescope Media versus Lucero, a student stood up, interrupted me mid-speech, and read a prepared statement that expressed the opinion that my Holocaust speech and my decisions were homophobic and disrespectful. Then, once the prepared statement was finished, a large group of students in unison got up and walked out the door. The point of all of this is as follows. I let the student speak, thanked her for her speech, and I would do the same thing again. It's the right thing to do. But as recent experience, my recent experience suggests, not everyone shares the view that letting others speak is the right thing. Rather than waiting until I finish my speech and invited questions and comments, which I said at the beginning I would do at the end of my presentation, the student interrupted me and decided that her speech was more important than mine. We call this the heckler's veto. Now, as I state in that very speech, I'm worried that our commitment to the basic free speech principles 
that we've had for a couple hundred of hundred years gets lost today. And as it happens, that's the subject of our panel. Is anyone really committed to free speech anymore? So we have a great panel to discuss this, and hopefully uh, that story sets the stage for the panel. Um, I'm going to introduce each panelist before they speak, um, but our first panelist, and we're going from the general to the more specific, um, is Professor Joel Gora, who's a professor of law at Brooklyn Law School. The highlights are he spent 10 years at the ACLU, uh, which as you might know, um, does some work on free speech. He's an expert in the First Amendment and election law, uh, particularly relating to campaign finance. And he worked on Buckley versus Vallejo, which is a, a, a case that certainly all the law students in the, in the room probably read in constitutional law, but certainly one uh, that's one of the biggest campaign finance slash free speech cases of all time. Um, he is going to talk, I think, at least from our conference call, about the importance of free speech. Thank you, Judge, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it is an honor to appear here on the Federalist Society platform. I want to thank Mike Domino and the Society officials for who have been so helpful in arranging this program. I also want to thank my wife, Anne Ray Martin, whom I met here in Washington when we were college students a long, long time ago, and who has been my constant companion and my best supporter ever since. The question for today's panel is, is anyone still committed to free speech? Well, I am. Uh, I've been privileged to have labored in the First Amendment vineyard my entire professional career, starting as a law school summer intern with the ACLU. In the rather modest, perhaps even dingy, ACLU offices of that era, they now have swanky offices down near Wall Street. But back then, uh, the offices were quite fitting for a little-known dissident cause organization. But there was a poster on the wall that, that uh, attracted my attention, and it had a quote from Pastor Martin Niemöller, a German anti-Nazi theologian. And it read as follows. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. The philosophy of that quote is what the protection of free speech is all about. The precious rights guaranteed by the First Amendment of religion, of speech, of press, of assembly, of the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances are and have to be indivisible and universal. If they are not made available to all, they will wind up being available to none. In fulfillment of this principle, uh, in my career and with my association with the ACLU, I have represented and supported the First Amendment rights of communists, socialists, SDS members, liberals, conservatives, anti-tax protesters, Ku Klux Klan members, Nazis, and all of the political points in between, as well as students, government employees, and members of the military. I also help represent pornographers, as well as politicians, following the, the tenets of two great First Amendment jurists, Hugo Black and William O. Douglas, that the First Amendment protects all kinds of speech, the profound as well as the profane. And I was privileged to represent the great senators James Buckley and the great, the great conservative senator James Buckley and the great liberal senator Eugene McCarthy from Minnesota uh, in Buckley versus Vallejo, the case that the judge was kind enough to mention. And more recently, I helped represent another great free speech champion, Senator Mitch McConnell of, of, of Kentucky. I teach my students that there are four bedrock theories for why we protect the First Amendment rights for everyone. First, such freedoms are essential to self-government. We know that. Second, such freedoms are essential to try as best we can to get as much pertinent information as we can, both to help guide our politics and help better our everyday lives. Third, freedom of speech is an essential component of individual dignity and autonomy anchored in liberty. Justice Brandeis understood that free speech is essential for both the individual and our society, and repression of speech is disastrous for both. And finally, have you noticed 
who's in charge of the government. Uh, there are people who always tell the truth, uh, always are honest, never would mislead you. Just kidding. A critical distrust of government and the power to use speech and press to check on the systemic oppression of which government is quite capable are yet further justifications for protecting and respecting our system of freedom of expression. And as uh, the judge mentioned, one of the greatest experiences in my professional life, which drove home so many of these principles, was serving as one of the lawyers in the Buckley case under the leadership, and I'm proud to say with the friendship, of the late great Judge Ralph K. Winter of the Second Circuit, who himself was a founding father of this organization. In fact, uh, I was so fortunate, he invited me to attend what was the, turned out to be the first meeting of the Federalist Society in 1982 here in Washington in this hotel, where uh, academics and, uh, and uh, judges from across the ideological spectrum argued about all of the points and matters that similar to what we're, we're doing now. And Judge Winter organized the Buckley litigation, uh, and it uh, challenged uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act passed in the early 1970s, an incredibly oppressive campaign finance law which cut to the core of the First Amendment safeguard of political speech. Congress severely limited political giving and spending, imposed intrusive and destructing, destructive disclosure requirements, and put enforcement of all of these repressions in the hands of a commission unconstitutionally consisting of members handpicked by Congress. We put together a so-called strange bedfellows coalition of outsiders, Senator Buckley from the conservative side, Senator McCarthy from the liberal side, and the only thing we had in common was our commitment to free speech and our view of how horrendous this new law was for freedom of speech. We called it the worst assault on political freedom since the alien and sedition laws, not to mention a corrupt incumbent protection act and the Supreme Court agreed with us on many of the core principles that we advanced. I just want to share briefly two passages in the Buckley opinion, which made it particularly clear why government cannot be trusted when it seeks to control political speech or any other kind of speech for that matter. First, to the argument that speech should be limited in the interest of equality, the court replied, the concept that government may strict, restrict the speech of some elements of our society in order to enhance the relative voice of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment because the First Amendment was designed to secure the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources and to assure unfettered interchange of ideas for the, for the bringing about of political and social change desired by the people. And the other uh, important uh, point of principle that the court made was equally categorical. The First Amendment denies government the power to determine that spending to promote one's political views is wasteful, excessive, or unwise. And here's the liberty part. In the free society ordained by our Constitution, it is not the government, but the people, individually as citizens and candidates, and collectively as associations and political committees who must retain control over the quantity and range of debate on public issues in a political campaign. These powerful teachings embody the theories that make protection of free speech a crucial element of our democracy. And now to move to our present environment. Um, the current Supreme Court has been perhaps the most speech protective court in memory, if not in our history. Exhibit A is the court's almost perfect record on striking down campaign finance restrictions as First Amendment violations, continuing and delivering on much of the work that we tried to start back in the Buckley case. The, the unjustly maligned Citizens United decision was a tribute to the role of political speech as the mainstay of our democracy and a warning, excuse me, of the grave dangers of letting the government write the rules and tamper with our political speech. Whatever might, one might think of the court's handiwork in other areas, in First Amendment law, its, its record has been terrific, not perfect, but terrific, extremely and consistently protective of First Amendment rights and values. I once referred to it as a sort of a free speech Camelot, protecting core First Amendment rights against government repression. So that's another reason why I say yes to the question of does anybody still care about free speech. I think the Supreme Court does. Again, not perfectly, certainly not in every case, but in the last five years their batting average is 800. Not too shabby. Um, and by the way, those of you who, who uh, care about religious freedom, 
another part of the First Amendment. I think the Roberts Court record in that regard has also been outstanding. It has, been, uh, it has both recognized and safeguarded the protections of the Free Exercise Clause while reasonably moderating the concerns of the Establishment Clause against excessive commingling of church and state. Although sometimes the Roberts Court has taken a more modest path in these cases, uh, the road has been headed in the right direction. And so in my view, and with respect to my distinguished co-panelists, uh, I would, for example, be leery of letting government solve the problems of the internet and the powerful entities that control it. Uh, the court has spoken about the vast democratic fora of the internet as a positive First Amendment force. And although the outrageous exercise of censorship by the big tech companies has been deplorable, I think far worse would be government decreed censorship. Justice Anthony Kennedy warned against the establishment of a ministry of truth to censor our free speech for, quote, misinformation. Uh, do you really want the government, this government, put in charge of what we can say and what we can not say? Likewise, I would be hesitant to encourage the government to outlaw certain themes or doctrines and prohibit them from being taught in our schools. Obviously, uh, con conduct in schools which violates the, pr the principles of, of racial equality of the Brown case is to be deplored. Conduct in schools which forces children, particularly K through 12, uh, to take oaths that, that they don't wish to take violates the Barnett case going back uh, 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 to World War II. Uh, so there are things that we should be concerned about in terms of what in school, but the, the notion of, of outlawing uh, uh, the teaching of certain things or the expression of certain points of view, uh, I don't think that fits with what I've just described as the First Amendment. I'm old enough to remember the anti-communist excesses of the 1950s and 1960s when communist doctrines were often banned from being taught in school, let alone advanced on the streets. I think we can work out the problems of how to best educate our children, particularly our, our young children in K through 12, through the democratic process as the encouraging political results of last week should convince us. Uh, I think it is far better to arm the people with enough information about what is happening with the school than to have legislatures or other bodies, Congress and the legislature shall make no law, outlawing uh, a speech, deciding what topics can and cannot be discussed or what ideas can or cannot be expressed. Um, um, I think we, it, it is important uh, that we put our faith uh, in the people. And finally, um, uh, since I am a, a true believer in the existential necessity of free speech, I would hesitate uh, the minimum, I would hesitate to minimize uh, its value or its efficiency or its coherence. I would support the Supreme Court's efforts to keep speech as free as possible. The Roberts Court record has not been perfect or spotless, but I think it has been extremely good in affording maximum protection for free speech, and those efforts, I think, should be praised and not, and not uh, criticized. Finally, in the long run, the real work will be to nourish and culture the culture of free speech. We have had one in America captured by the familiar adage, I may disagree with what you say, judge, but I will defend to the right, to the death, I don't disagree, but the students might have, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Uh, we protect freedom for the thought that we hate. So if you see or hear words or thoughts that offend or enrage you, the answer is to answer them, not censor them. To condemn them, not cancel them. Censorship of bad ideas is a bad idea. Free speech is nonpartisan. It doesn't want to be liberal, it doesn't want to be conservative, it just wants to be free. Thank you, Professor Gora, that was, that was fantastic. Um, next we have Ms. Ms. Nicole Neely, president and founder of Parents Defending Education. Um, which seeks to educate and empower families to push back against, and I'm quoting here, activists seeking to politicize education, impose toxic new curriculums, and treat our kids as members of identity groups to enlist in diverse new causes. Um, she also previously founded Speech First, an organization that defends uh, college students' free speech rights, um, and which has litigated uh, speech cases uh, all over the country. 
Um, she is going to discuss, at least again from the conference call, some of the chilling effect um, that we just that I talked about in my earlier uh, opening. Um, thank you so much, Judge Strauss and Mike. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I am here today to present a view from the ground. Four years ago, I launched Speech First, a campus free speech organization that defends students' First Amendment rights uh, through litigation. In its short life, we have sued six public universities around the country, including both my alma mater, the University of Illinois, as well as my husband's alma mater, the University of Texas. In case you are wondering, they do still ask you for money after you sue them. It is very awkward. Um, and then earlier this year, I, I launched Parents Defending Education, as the judge said. Um, we work on issues in K-12 schools, including free speech, but also racial and gender discrimination. We currently have two open lawsuits, one of which involves a challenge to a speech code um, in a public school district, Wellesley Public Schools punishes speech that is biased, which it defines as offensive, has an impact on others, treats another person differently, or demonstrates conscious or unconscious bias. The school gives examples of bias incidents, which include telling rude jokes that mock a protected group in person or through any electronic device, imitating someone with any kind of disability or imitating someone's cultural norm or language. A student's speech is biased when he or she describes founding era Native American tribes as roaming, wandering, or roving across the land because such language implicitly justifies the seizure of Native land by more goal-directed white Americans who traveled or settled their way westward. Students who use words like normal and regular to refer to one person or way of life as opposed to another are also biased because they perpetuate hegemony. <laughs> Um, now, I wish I could be as optimistic as Professor Gora, but across the country, I see bad policies at all levels of our education system that have been designed to and are, sadly, successfully chilling speech. Schools regularly and aggressively employ overbroad, vague speech policies and Orwellian bias response programs that encourage students and people to file online reports, often anonymously, to tell on each other. Um, in Wellesley, they called it the snitch line. These policies would make the Stasi or the CCP proud, and they're now not only in higher education schools, but also in K-12 schools. Um, the tidy aspect of these programs is that they don't actually need to bust everybody. They just need to get one or two people in trouble, and it scares everybody else into silence because it sends the message, you say the same thing and we're coming for you next. As a result of these speech policies, um, members of all communities, um, are discouraged from discussing controversial topics. The problem, of course, is that the window of acceptable discourse these days is very narrow and is shifting ever leftward at an increasingly rapid pace. Um, so basically, nearly everything is controversial these days. So like, what is the proof? Um, I watched the panel earlier that Greg Lukianoff was on. He mentioned that FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, does an annual poll talking, about, talking to students. Um, their 2021 poll found that more than 80% of students on college campuses report self-censoring their viewpoints on a regular basis, um, and 21% say they, they censor themselves often. 51% of students say that racial inequality is a really, really difficult topic to discuss on campus, period. 46% say abortion, 42% say transgender issues. Only 12% of students feel very comfortable publicly disagreeing with a professor. 13% feel comfortable expressing an unpopular opinion to their fellow students on a social media platform that has their name on it and 16% felt comfortable expressing their views on a controversial political topic in class, period. Those statistics should horrify everyone in this room. And it's worth noting that this chilling doesn't just affect students, it also affects teachers, faculty, and administrators. They're all equally vulnerable. Teaching methods, like the Socratic method, playing devil's advocate, um, that's now interpreted by many people to be offensive because you are challenging someone. That is a declaration of war. You can't even do that. Part of the problem is that how schools, students, and activists now define offense and harassment is not a legal standard. It's not the Davis standard, not my friend Mike. Um, but instead, it's now judged by impact rather than intent. Um, objective truth is now replaced with my truth. Um, when Speech First sued the University of Michigan, the school's bias response team website said the most important way to determine whether a bias in incident occurred was your own feelings. So that's the kind of stand that we are judging these issues by and that students are reporting on each other. For many years, activists asserted that speech is violence. And then last summer, after all the protests, that morphed into silence is violence. So put that another way. Um, not only people must speak up to avoid being targeted as an enemy, but you have to say the right thing. Um, they want the real estate inside your mind and inside your mouth. It's little wonder that self-censorship is now the rule of the law, uh, the, the rule of the, uh, the law of the land, because the level of risk involved in saying the wrong thing is often just too high for basically anybody but the bravest student out there to bear. 
Um, as a result, whole lines of conversation are just absolutely off the table. Argument, disagreement, humor, satire, parody, people are terrified, um, and they're just not speaking. Um, the educational experience from kindergarten up through law school is weaker as a result of this. Um, students are not exposed to a variety of perspectives, and they are being taught what to think, not how to think. Coerced and compelled speech are taking place. Applicants to universities now must write diversity statements, and they know that if they fail to do so, or if they are not sufficiently enthusiastic, they will not get that job. Um, children who still believe in the tooth fairy are being asked what their pronouns are. Um, teacher, <laughs> teachers have to confess their privilege. That's what is taking place in schools across the country. This should worry all of us. Viewpoint discrimination is another rampant problem. Administrators from across the country regularly make clear where they stand on certain issues, pressuring other people to fall in line. In 2016, after the presidential election, the president of the University of Michigan sent an all-campus email out saying, 90% of you voted against hate yesterday. Um, after George, Flo George Floyd's murder last year, um, countless districts across the country sent um, emails out to their community saying that we are systemically racist and privileged, we must do better. Um, and in Wellesley, the district that we sued, um, the district started to hang Black Lives Matter flags at schools around the district. Um, a number of families in the district felt that you know, they were concerned with BLM's position on defunding the police and on supporting Hamas. So a number of families went to the district and they said, well, would you put up an Israeli flag and a thin blue line flag just to show some balance? And the district said, no, not interested. So they put their thumb on the scale and they made very clear where they stood. Um, now, I am a recovering libertarian. I am definitely inclined to blame government across the board for many things. Um, but it is worth noting that in a lot of these cases, um, censorship officers are actually coming from students themselves and not always administrations, which I think is something, again, that should worry all of us. Um, on college campuses, student governments regularly reject applications from student organizations that want to get off the ground, saying that groups like Turning Point USA, Young America's Foundation, or Students for Life are hateful. Um, explicit demand letters are being sent to administrations on a regular basis um, with, you know, asking them for, to put in place different pro um, policies, programs. At Tulane University, the Black Student Union issued a list of demands, including for the school to both police and investigate speech and issue consequences for students that had wrong think, as well as for the school to create a mandatory class on Tulane's history of racism. Um, at the University of Texas, a local Antifa chapter that was full of students um, started doxing conservative students from the YCT, the Young, Young Conservatives of Texas, and the school just threw up their hands and didn't do anything until the Attorney General actually expressed some concern about what was taking place. And then, just to get back to that fire survey, um, they found that two-thirds of students say it is acceptable to shout down a speaker to prevent them from speaking on campus. And almost one in four um, say that it's acceptable to use violence to stop a campus speech. So, that's terrific. Um, no, this, obviously, this worries me and it should worry all of you, because if students don't understand the power and the majesty of the First Amendment, that this is how disenfranchised groups throughout history have been able to persuade and change policy, from ab abolishing slavery to Jim Crow to women's suffrage, um, our country is going to be in real trouble. Um, these illiberal behaviors, once they are learned, be it in the K-12 setting or in higher ed, are taken out into the real world once students graduate. Um, and as we all know, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And so I encourage all of you, after you leave here, figure out what is taking place, not only in your alma mater, but in your local schools where your children are. Because the only way that we will be able to put an end to these toxic policies is to um, out them, end them, um, and demand better because liberal values such as free expression, academic freedom, and open discourse are the most essential elements um, for our children to be able to succeed in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neely. That was great. Um, now we have a dissenter. No federal Federalist Society event would be good, uh, a panel event would be uh, complete without having people who disagree with each other. It's one of the things that makes the Federalist Society a great organization. Um, professor Stanley Fish, who's a professor of law at Florida, Univer Florida International University College of Law and a visiting professor at Cardozo, is a public intellectual and a prolific author. He has over 200 publications and books. Um, he's received multiple awards, um, and he is going to talk about the problems with uh, free speech doctrine and how more speech is not necessarily the right answer. Good afternoon. If I'm a dissenter, I'm sometimes a conservative one because I think that my First Amendment jurisprudence fits perfectly with that of Justice Alito in recent decisions 
and also with Justice Thomas in many decisions, including the infamous bong hits for Jesus decision. But the question posed for us, is anyone still committed to free speech, assumes that free speech is a standalone and identifiable entity, a doctrine or value whose general shape is clear, although over time that shape will be filled in with different particulars. I want to argue that particulars are the entire story. As I put it 30 years ago, there is no such thing as free speech. There are just situations in which someone who wants to do something and is blocked or prevented by law turns his or her cause into a free speech issue, then secures the desired outcome by dressing it in the resonant cultural vocabulary of the First Amendment. Legal theorist Frederick Schauer calls this move First Amendment opportunism. His example is a 1976 case, Virginia State Board of Pharmacy, in which the court struck down a law that prevented large chain pharmacies from advertising their prices. What the courts did, as Justice Rehnquist complained in dissent, was turn the effort to sell more toothpaste or toilet paper into a noble exercise of First Amendment freedom. And the court did this by equating the potent political phrase, free flow of ideas, with a new phrase, free flow of commercial advertising, a form of communication previously held not to rise to the level of constitutional protection. Now, one could describe this result as, as a discovery by the court of the true scope of the First Amendment, which only now stands revealed in 1976 after 200 years. But I would describe the case differently as the reconfiguration by the court of the First Amendment under the pressure of a policy interest, chain pharmacies, that played the First Amendment opportunistic game with great skill. The difference between these two descriptions is that in the first, where what we now have is a realization of what the First Amendment really means. In the first, there is a First Amendment that abides through time. While under the second description, there is the name First Amendment, but nothing inside it. Nothing inside it until a successful political effort gives it content. Now, I find support for this account this account in which the First Amendment isn't anything, but is just what political and rhetorical circumstances make it to be. I find support for this account in the pronouncements of three notable legal theorists. First, Frederick Schauer again, who says that the First Amendment, quote, is nothing more than a particular set of social, political, and ideological moves that are available at a particular point of time. That's letter perfect. My second theorist, Larry Alexander, says that, quote, freedom of expression is a vacuous, by which he means empty concept. There are just different background conditions for expression, each of which will lead to different substantive outcomes. And it is those different background conditions and not any free speech principles that will be doing the work in a particular case. The third of my theorists, Robert Post, draws the moral, and I quote, the search for any general free speech principle is bound to fail, unquote. Now this does not mean that First Amendment jurisprudence fails, only that its successes its ability to clarify for a time what can and cannot be done with words, its successes are the product of political and rhetorical skills, not of some abstract value. Indeed, the First Amendment, insofar as it is anything, is a rhetoric, and in my vocabulary, that's a compliment, not a criticism. The First Amendment is a rhetoric, a collection and ensemble of talismanic phrases and slogans, 
ritually invoked examples, fabricated entities like the marketplace of ideas, shaky distinctions, ad hoc exceptions to those distinctions. It is a rhetoric always moving and changing while proclaiming an advertised coherence that will not stand up to interrogation, but it is a rhetoric that manages to do work nevertheless. That work will always be ad hoc and opportunistic. Let's try the public's right to know. Let's try time, man, or place. Let's try two-track analysis. Let's try fighting words. You know the rest of the list. Now, the power of the First Amendment as a rhetoric as a piece of political currency cannot be overestimated. It can be felt even in precincts where there are very few, if any, free speech issues at all. I am thinking here of the academy, where if we listen to the news, free speech conundrums abroad, abound rather. I am here to say that there are generally no free speech issues on campus. Where exactly might they be found if they were there? In the classroom? No. Students have no free speech rights. In fact, I would go far as to say students have no rights at all of any kind. Students have no free speech rights. Whether they get to say something or have what they say, uh, or have what they say taken seriously is entirely a matter of the instructor's judgment. I don't confess my privilege in the classroom. I insist on it. <laughs> but in turn, the instructor, and I include myself, is severely constrained in what materials he or she can assign, constrained by the current state of the discipline, by the in-place bureaucratic rules of the department, and most of all, by the nature and history of the enterprise. And the instructor is constrained, too, in the kind of things that can be said about those materials. Well, is there a free speech component in, component in hiring, retention, and promotions? Absolutely not. There is no requirement that points of view be represented on a faculty. So long as the reason for a personal health decision, positive or negative, is an educational and not a political one, the decision is legitimate, although it may not be wise. There is no such thing as intellectual diversity, and there certainly should not be. Now, what about extracurricular context? Invited speakers, panel discussions, comedians, rock concerts, and all the rest. There are two answers to that question, and they end up in the same place. Either extracurricular is understood to mean a form or location of entertainment, and therefore it lies in the discretion of the proprietor of the venue to decide who gets to appear, or extracurricular functions are extensions of the university's mission. And again, it is up to the proprietor, to administrators, to decide without any free speech anxieties, which proposed events further the mission and which do not. No forum analysis is required. It's just a managerial decision made within the context of an enterprise defined by its constitutive goals. Protecting and enhancing free speech is not a constitutive goal of the university. Or to put it even more simply, Free speech is not an academic value. Free speech is not an, an academic value. It's not what the university is in business for. The university, and it seems odd to have to say this, is in the education business, where the advancement of knowledge, not the advancement of free speech interest, is the goal and obligation. Now, the university is in the freedom of inquiry business. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, is in the freedom of inquiry business. Uh, um, uh, yeah, the difference between the two, between a free speech regime and a freedom of inquiry regime, is that in a free speech regime, everyone's voice deserves to be heard and no voice should be dismissed and silent peremptorily. In a free inquiry regime, Silencing voices is the official responsibility of almost everyone in the workshop, of hiring committees, department chairpersons, deans, chancellors, journal editors, all of whom, as you all know, 
all of whom uh, decide which voices will make it to the podium or on the journal page and which will be sent away. When a free inquiry regime is working properly, it performs all of the exclusions that a free speech regime would disallow. The point is one most university administrators don't understand. In fact, most university administrators don't understand anything. There's barely been a, a, there's barely been a more sorry lot in the history uh, of the world. They don't understand it, and because they don't understand it, they tie themselves in knots when some troll or predator comes to town asking for a place in the square. And then they consult the school's legal counsel. Always a bad idea, because the school legal counsel only wants to do one thing, avoid lawsuits. Uh, so the answer is always going to be the same. Uh, so the administrators literally don't know what their job is. They are not free speech enforcers. They are protectors and enablers of a process designed to introduce students to conventional wisdom and to encourage them to go beyond conventional wisdom. That is a task, as all of you know, difficult enough by itself. And it should not be made more difficult and incoherent by adding to it the task of being a First Amendment watchdog especially when there are very few First Amendment issues in sight, except for those that have been manufactured out of administrative ignorance. So, with response to the question put to us, the answer is to, it, to the question, is anyone committed to free speech in the academy? My answer is, I hope not. But what about, what about cancel culture and woke tyranny? Whichever, which all, most of the speakers uh, at, this, uh, at, at this conference just love to give little histories of. Um, you, you, you can almost see the self-congratulatory glee with which these little histories uh, are rehearsed. What about a celebrated professor at Michigan who was forced to resign in the wake of a backlash following his showing of the 1965 version of Othello played in an Academy Award nominated performance by Laurence Olivier in blackface? What about the distinguished environmental scientist at Chicago who is deplatformed at MIT because he said in public that hiring should be based on merit metrics rather than on the political metrics of race, ethnicity, and gender? These two and others like them, including a judge here, and as a 15-year member of the Duke Law School faculty, I apologize. Uh, these. <laughs> Uh, these two and others like them are casualties and victims, no doubt, but not because their free speech rights have been violated. They spoke freely without government sanction, but because faculty members and mostly administrators have not come to their professional defense. It's a professional issue, not a moral or philosophical issue. Have not stood up, uh, have stopped foot up there for their professional right to determine for themselves within the guidelines of the academy what they choose to teach and what they choose to say about the way academic decisions should be made. It is again a failure of administrative nerve, not a failure to be faithful to a constitutional principle, and it is a failure that can be remedied by installing administrators who will not tolerate interference from either outside or internal constituencies with the proper business of the university, which is not to make my point one last time, the flourishing of free speech. And where will such administrators, administrators be, found, be found? Well, I have some time on my hands and I rent out. So I was told when I first joined the academy that uh, good academic work is provocative and gets people to respond. I can say that that was provocative and will we'll merit a response. Um, so our, our next uh, panelist, and certainly uh, last but not least, is Mr. Mike Davis, um, who has a lot of uh, different projects on his hands. He's the president and founder of the Internet Account Accountability Project. Um, he's also the founder of the Article 3 Project. 
Um, he leads the unsilenced majority, which opposes cancel culture and fights back against the woke mob and their enablers. And how I got to know him uh, was he served as chief counsel for nominations for Senator Chuck Grassley, who was the chair of the committee uh, when my nomination went through in 2018. Um, he also clerked, uh, Mike clerked for Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court and on the Tenth Circuit. Um, and he is from, well, he at least went to school in the Midwest. He went to the University of Iowa for undergraduate and the University of Iowa for law school, a school that I'm particularly fond of because I teach there every summer. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Davis. So thank you very much. I'm here. I'm going to talk about big tech um, and how they fit into this free speech debate. Thank you, Judge, uh, for putting this together. And thank you to my much more distinguished panelist for allowing me to speak. Um, we face a free speech crisis in America. And the reason is, is too many Americans are scared to express their personal views. They're scared of getting ridiculed, censored, silenced deplatformed, fired, even canceled. And this free speech crisis is caused by people who are ignorant and arrogant enough to believe that they are protecting us. Uh, whether it's their deluded belief that they are protecting democracy, which is what we're hearing lately about, you know, how we need to protect democracy, mostly from Trump people, um, protecting us from COVID, or somehow protecting us from ourselves just generally. Um, and having differing views from our protectors is dangerous in their minds. Uh, today's biggest proponents, enablers, and enforcers of this censorship and cancel culture are the trillion dollar big tech monopolists. And that's Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, along with their little brother, Twitter. Um, I say little brother because they're, ins they're insignificant in the market, but they are the ones that uh, get big tech in the most trouble. So um, because of their antitrust amnesty and their section 230 immunity, these big tech monopolists have an unholy alliance with big government to censor those uh, with whom they disagree. And when the government is dealing with a monopolist, there's only one neck to choke. Um, we just saw smoking gun evidence of this when the White House press secretary nonchalantly announced that the government is working with Facebook to censor COVID misinformation. As if the COVID science doesn't evolve as we learn new facts, Tony Fauci is some infallible COVID god, and Jen Psaki runs the Ministry of Truth. And big tech ever eager to keep the regime happy, takes its censorship marching orders. Let's talk about more examples of big tech's political censorship. Hillary Clinton still falsely claims that Donald Trump colluded with the Russians to steal the 2016 election. Yet big tech deplatformed Trump as a sitting president for claiming that the 2020 election was stolen. And before the election, Big Tech censored the New York Post, our nation's oldest continuous newspaper, for publishing negative stories on Joe Biden's potential uh, foreign corruption, including uh, the discovery of Hunter Biden's infamous laptop. How did Big Tech justify this brazen political censorship? They claimed the emails on the laptop were fake, and this was a Russian disinformation campaign, both of which we know are clearly false. Uh, big tech has been particularly egregious with its COVID censorship. They're censoring noted doctors, scientists, and even a sitting, uh, sitting United States Senator who also happens to be a doctor, Rand Paul. How does censoring dissenting doctors and scientists help convince vaccine hesitant Americans, disproportionately black and Hispanic Americans, overcome their concerns and get vaccinated. Censorship is counterproductive. It's even deadly. It politicizes the scientific debate and makes people lose confidence in the science, particularly the science behind vaccines. COVID vaccines are even more effective than advertised as it relates to hospitalizations and deaths. 
but many people don't believe this. One of the reasons is because censorship has created mistrust. We don't need Tony Fauci, Jen Psaki, and their censors at Facebook to protect us from ourselves. Get the information out there, good or bad, right or wrong, and let people make their own informed decisions in consultation with their own medical providers. How did we get here and how did we get past this? During the internet's infancy, Congress passed Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. The, the purpose of Section 230 was to promote free speech uh, online by shielding the internet providers from defamation lawsuits based upon what their users post. So if the good judge here goes on Twitter and says that Mike Davis is a fall down drunk, I could sue the judge, but I can't sue Twitter under Section 230. Unless, of course, it's true, which it is, so I couldn't sue either of you. So, um, um, so that's, what, that's what Section 230 does. Section 230 made a lot of sense at the time, back in 1996. We wanted to promote the internet economy and free speech, free speech generally, and this required protecting these internet infants from defamation lawsuits, oftentimes dri driven by the big publishers that would have wiped these internet startups off the map. Fast forward 25 years and the, the public square is now largely online. And there's been a ch changing of the online guard. And they're increasingly much more powerful and much less concerned about free speech. Indeed, we've replaced <clears throat> the internet infants of 1996, America Online, CompuServe, and Prodigy with today's trillion dollar big tech monopolies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. Through a bad combination of Section 230 immunity sense 1996 and antitrust amnesty over the last decade, starting under President Obama when he was trying to take care of his, his buddies in Silicon Valley, these big tech platforms have amassed too much power and control over our lives. And they are using Section 230 as a censorship sword instead of as the intended free speech shield. There are no real competitors to big tech, especially as it relates to online speech. Google owns YouTube. Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. If these platforms actually had to compete for their users, including for their users' very valuable online time and data, it's much, much less likely the platforms would mistreat their users, including censoring them. A good example of this is Parler, a startup competitor to Twitter. Conservatives angry with Twitter's censorship began to join Parler in a mass exodus from Twitter. And Parler quickly attained a $1.3 billion valuation. So instead of trying to woo back these conservative users from a new competitor by changing its censorship policies, Twitter simply killed the competition. Indeed, Parler got blamed for the January 6th protest at the Capitol, even though the FBI's evidence is very clear that the protesters largely organized on Facebook. Then Google and Apple used that as an excuse to kick Parler out of the App Store duopoly. And then Amazon kicked Parler off the internet. So there goes the build your own argument that we often hear on these antitrust discussions. Um, Twitter continues its censorship business as usual. Why did we ignore the, the Sherman Act, our century old antitrust law, for over a decade and allow these big tech platforms to become trillion dollar monopolists? Why did we allow big tech to use Section 230 to stifle instead of promote free speech? And how do we fix this? Um, we must do two important things. Number one, we must end big tech's antitrust amnesty by updating and actually enforcing our century old antitrust laws. We cannot continue to allow trillion dollar big tech monopolists to kill com competitors like Parler, control the online public square, and censor our thoughts. We must break up big tech. And the good news is that there are six bills that have been passed out of the House Judiciary Committee on a bipartisan basis, believe it or not, that rein in big tech. And these, these House bills are championed by Congressman Ken Buck, uh, an all-star conservative from Colorado, uh, and they are picking up steam in the Senate. Uh, some key senators are, are sponsoring several of these bills in the Senate, including uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, my former boss, along with Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley. So there is a very good chance that two, three, four, maybe even more of these 
six bills will become law this year, um, over the next year, I'm sorry. Um, and we should all support these efforts. Number two, we must reform or repeal big tech's Section 230 immunity so they can no longer censor, silence, and uh, deplatform, even cancel those with whom they disagree. This leads to government sponsored censorship with Section 230. And Jen Psaki made it clear that the government is actively working with Facebook to censor Americans. So the bottom line is, is we need more competition, not less. Um, we need more free speech, not less. And so thank you for hearing me out and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, that, just like the other ones, was a great, a great and provocative talk. Um, I'm going to uh, take the moderator's privilege and ask a couple of questions. We will move to questions that I actually can't. These lights are blinding. I know we have a, uh, a one up here, a uh, microphone. I think we have one in the back. I'm assuming we do. We usually do. And if we do, uh, you could certainly start lining up in about in about you know five to ten minutes uh, once we once we conclude with some of my questions. I'm going to start where uh, where Mike left off. Um, so when I gave gave the aforementioned speech, one of the most common things I talk and I talk about you know the, how important free speech is. And one of the questions I get asked at the end of the speech inevitably because of a dissent that Justice Thomas, or a concurrence, I can't remember which, that Justice Thomas wrote last year about big tech, um, is what do we do about it? Um, and, and Mike tried to answer that question and did, a, did an admirable job. Now, I usually defer because I say that issue is bound to come before me, which is true, it is bound to come before me, but the real truth of the matter is, it's a really hard question and I don't know the answer. Um, so it's a great way to hide behind my own, uh, the, the own sh my own shield that Article 3 creates for me and the, the rules of conduct. Um, so I'm going to pose it to the panel. What do we do? Uh, Mike suggested uh, uh, repealing 230. Uh, he suggested um, uh, breaking up the big tech companies like Twitter. Um, but I don't know the answer. Is there a way to promote free speech? Um, in these online tech companies, and should we be doing that? I guess that's a question as well. Um, they, a lot of people refer to social media as being harsh and brutal, and I've heard people say cesspool in terms of what people say on there. Um, so what should we do about it? Well, um, I'm not an antitrust expert, um, but my sense of things is um, we have uh, more information than we know what to do with. Uh, in addition to all the social media, big tech companies, we have all the cable channels, we have all the internet channels. Um, our problem is not a lack of information, it is m more information than we can process. And, um, and, num and number two, uh, the protections of 230 are designed, were designed, and still do, enhance a great deal of speech on the internet by allowing the, the platforms not to be sued for the, for the content of the speech, even though you can, uh, you can um, sue the, the third party, the, uh, uh, the speakers. And, um, and I think, um, again, the, the real question is um, not what the problem is, but what's the solution? And how does the solution com comport with the free speech principles that we are talking about? I don't think any of us agree. I agree with almost everything that was said about the problems we have. Um, but I think uh, where we may be uh, part company is, is what the solutions should be. Um, if we break up big tech because we think we don't like the way they're censoring ideas or lack of information or tr a lack of truth that, that um, um, we think is, cor is incorrect, I mean, is that a proper reason for breaking them up because we don't like uh, the, the content controls they're exercising? I mean, is, is there really a lack of competition uh, for sources of information? I mean, if we could figure out some way to have uh, protect the parlors of the world, uh, that might be a narrow kind of approach. There was a, a wonderful panel this morning that talked about these issues, uh, talking about whether common carrier status could be given. Um, uh, and um, uh, so that the, the tech companies would have, part of them would be like a phone company, and the other part of them would be like a, the New York Times, like an electronic New York Times. Now, I'm not familiar enough with the, how the tech industry works to know if that's feasible, but one could do that. Um, and I I'm, I'm, was reminded of finish, I, I don't mean to filibuster, um, uh, there's a case that, that, that people really uh, refer to that's sort of a, a, a split decision. In the early 70s, 
uh, the uh, Pittsburgh Press uh, had a, uh, employment columns, uh, jobs columns, and one column was male interest and the other was female interest. And the local uh, uh, Human Rights Commission said, you can't do that, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex or gender and employment. And they said, well, we are a newspaper, well, we can do that. And the court said, well, you know, you're a newspaper, but your ad advertising column, that's not really part of your newspaper. And so you can have all the free speech and press you want on your newspaper, but, th but that doesn't mean uh, that carries over to your, your, uh, your, your um, uh, job wanted or your ads column. So maybe some kind of an approach like that. Uh, but uh, but uh, putting them out of business, I don't think, uh, serves free speech. I think Mike's right. We need more speech and not less speech. Let me just, uh, uh, well, you want to talk about big tech, so I'll... Yeah, go sounds ahead. good. Anyone else want to comment? Uh, as someone who is not a lawyer but only plays one on TV, um, I, I think that um, Vivek Ramaswamy has a really interesting take on this, where some of the tech companies have been acting as state actors. Um, there have been, the Center for American Liberty has a lawsuit right now against Twitter that shows that they had worked with the California Secretary of State to take information down. And so if there is that partnership that is taking place, I think that that might be a valid way to go after some of these issues. They should not be an arm of the government. That, that raises major concerns to me. Could I just add a footnote? I agree with that. I agree the allegations in the suit that President Trump brought about collusion uh, between the government uh, uh, and the big tech companies to censor him and others, uh, I think if proven, that would be, uh, I mean, after all, in con law, if the government gets into a partnership with a private company and the private company does things which the government cannot, the government can be, uh, the private company told, stop it. Uh, your partner can't do it and you can't do it. Um, so I think the notion of collusion, both between the executive branch and big tech, as well as between the uh, legislative branch. People have said that some of the uh, suggested legislative enactments that have been uh, 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 proposed against big tech are really just a way to, I don't want to say extort, uh, uh, influence big tech into uh, uh, changing policies that the legislatures don't like. Uh, that, to me, is a classic no-no under the First Amendment. All right. I know, Professor Fish, you were, you were anxious to say something as well. Yeah, I, too, attended that panel this morning, and I agree uh, with Professor Gore's estimation of its quality. Uh, and also, uh, I agree with what I think he would agree with, uh, we, we would also um, cite as uh, its solution. Uh, none of the panelists had one. And they all agree that the problem was a complicated uh, and they turned that problem around from the perspective of many lenses, uh, but none of them seem to provide a clear path uh, to a solving of the problem. I think that this, uh, that the high tech, what we might call the, um, the high tech factor, is a nice and visible illustration of something that uh, we've only begun to realize, which is that the First Amendment situation that is, the situation in which the First Amendment becomes especially a political value, is no longer what the framers assumed it to be when they first debated and then fashioned the First Amendment. Their model, if they had one, is more like the Norman Rockwell-style town meeting, uh, where there's a town meeting on an issue, should there be a new sewer system, uh, and all of the people in the room are generally people you know, and, and you and each of your neighbors gets up and has his or her say. And free speech is there to protect the monopoly uh, by the chairman or by the government in general of the megaphone, because free speech was, in, was uh, understood not, to be on, not only to be an important commodity, but a scarce commodity. Now, as Professor Gore has said a moment ago, we have more information than we know what to do with. And the problem is not a scarce resource that has to be husbanded in equitable ways. The problem is that it's a resource out of control that can hardly even be conceptually grasped uh, by any of us. To my mind, this is the result of the overvaluing of, of um, uh, transparency. I think transparency is one of the worst ideas that ever emerged on the face of the earth. Transparency is, I think, the, uh, the philosophical doctrine behind the old free speech mantra, the more speech, the better. The idea that if speech is allowed to flourish, 
then it itself then and and, and uh, is let out into the air of day and into sunlight, then somehow uh, those forms of speech which are injurious um, and not and not fruitful will be recognized for what they are, and the good forms of speech will emerge. As many in this room know, two statements by Justice Brandeis encapsulates this free speech optimism. Sunshine is the best of disinfectants, and the remedy for bad speech is more speech, not enforced silence. Again, the idea that if we let it all out, it will sort itself out. And as I have said many times, the only counter-argument to this is all of recorded history. <laughs> That's never happened, it's never gonna happen, and the disastrous effects of it's not happening are in fact magnified by the doctrine of transparency, which, which throws suspicion on gatekeepers, uh, filters, and experts, I love gatekeepers, filters, and experts, and spend most of my time every day trying to be all three. Uh, mm -hmm. Because independently of their operation, what you have is what you now have. Billions of pieces of data, and no way of assessing them. And therefore, billions of pieces of data that are just waiting to be gathered up by some mendacious or evil predator and put to bad uses. That's what we have. That's what the internet has given us. That's the context in which the big tech companies uh, are operating. And what to do about it beats me. You know, Professor Fish, you made me feel so much better by saying it's complicated and it beats you because you've been the First Amendment scholar forever and my Bob and Wee strategy of saying I can't, can't comment on it, uh, you made me feel better. I thought I was the dumb one in the room not knowing the answer. Uh, Mr. Davis, do you have anything to say about this? <clears throat> it's certainly entertaining. Um, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would just say that uh, I, I, I don't think we need guardians of our thoughts. Uh, we don't need uh, you know, nannies in big tech. We don't need nannies in academia. We don't need nannies in government to protect us from information. Um, let's get the information out there. And I think that we just have to have confidence and and in, in the indiv in, in, in individuals to uh, be able to come to their own decisions and hopefully they'll make the own, their, their own decision that's right for them, so. Remember original sin. <laughs> All right, so I have one more question then I promise we're gonna go out to the audience. So um, I, I asked the question that I didn't know about. I'm now gonna ask the question with, with which I'm all too familiar. Uh, which is what's happening on college campuses around the United States. I mean, everyone knows the stories. Uh, the Yale Law School where, um, where a particular student was sort of, well, was intimidated uh, into trying, in trying to get him to apologize for things he had said uh, in an email. Um, there's certainly some, some examples that uh, Professor Fish had mentioned. Um, it's, it's tough, I mean, in, in one way, um, you know, this should be a marketplace of ideas. On the other, when anyone gets offended or when somebody says the wrong thing, um, administrators don't do anything. Um, my, in my situation, uh, the director of career services apologized and, and that was sort of it. I never heard from the dean or anything else because I think there's a fear of not siding with sort of the more virtuous side that somehow you're gonna be canceled too. That inaction against a perceived injustice is somehow a, a harm in of itself. Um, so how do we approach this? What do we do in the educational context? Um, Professor Fish talks about free inquiry. I, you know, I kind of have my own ideas. This one I know, know something about, but I'll, I'll leave it to you, you all the experts. Well, um, I uh, sometimes in my writing speak about how we have, a, um, we have systemic censorship in America. Uh, that by virtue of uh, different rules and regulations, uh, we have to watch what we say from pre-K to 401k, uh, from being in school, starting in kindergarten, all the way through college and graduate school. There are rules governing what we can say and what we can't say, some of them uh, to uh, enforce uh, anti-discrimination, some of them beyond that. And you enter the workplace and there are rules that control what you can say and don't say. Uh, uh, so uh, there's no question that um, we are facing, un I think, unprecedented societal uh, censorship. Um, 
Number two, when it takes the form of the kind of cases that have been talked about, of students penalized for what they're saying, of faculty penalized for things that they should be entitled to say, I think the answer is exactly what Nicole says and does, namely to, to litigate the hell out of it and to bring as many lawsuits as you can, claiming that the free speech rights of those students or those faculty members have been violated. Of course, if they're private institutions, you're um, less able to do so, but there are a number of states that have passed laws making political discrimination uh, 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 equally um, um, Im improper uh, as uh, racial or, or sexual or uh, sexual orientation or other forms of religious discrimination as well. So that gives you a, 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 um, a, a, an error. But I mean, I think you really, it, it's the message you've been hearing. You have to fight these things. Um, and you'd be surprised, I think, if you fight them intently enough and often enough you can sometimes change the, the direction of the ship. I'm, I was thinking back uh, a long time ago, there were a couple of college cases that I worked on at the ACLU in the Supreme Court. One of them involved a college alternate newspaper that uh, had a headline with a rather uh, unpleasant, vulgar seven, uh, and, uh, 12 letter word, I'll let your imagination figure out what it was, but it was reporting that a, gr a group with that word as its title had been uh, quitted in court. And the students were kicked out of school, University of Missouri, I believe, for running that newspaper. And we represented them. The Supreme Court said, hey, uh, that's an ugly word, but the, pre the First Amendment protects ugly words and dismissed all the charges against the student. We also represented the SDS, which some of you may remember was a very left-wing student group in the 60s and 70s. They were kicked off the campus at uh, Connecticut College, a state university, because they were too radical. And we uh, filed suit. The Supreme Court said, you can't do that. They haven't done anything violent. Uh, they're simply espousing ideas that most people have no use for. And they cannot be denied college uh, uh, standing for that. Um, you bring enough of those cases with uh, attorney's fees available under Section 1988, I think it is, under the civil rights laws, if they're state and local government universities or institutions. And at some point, the insurance companies will say, hey, knock it off. Uh, you can't have this kind of systemic censorship. So that's, that's how I would attack mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Others? <laughs> well, should I go Professor Fish first, and I'll let yeah. uh, yeah. Ms. Neely. Uh, first of all, having a headline in a student newspaper, and one would have to say whether it was a student newspaper in the K-12, K-12 through context or the higher education context, is a matter that, have been, that has been discussed in a number of Supreme Court cases, as you know, starting with Tinker v. Des Moines and going through uh, five or six others. And, and one line of argument with which I agree says uh, that student most newspapers are generally under the aegis of the administration. And even though it may not be wise for an administration to step in, an administration can step in. That's a side issue. The more important issue is what do we do about this, this phenomenon on campus the magnitude of which I do not deny. In fact, I, 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 th I thoroughly uh, agree with it. And there I would go again, Professor Gore, to a f statement of yours where you say administrators don't do anything. That's because they're bad administrators. <laughs> as, as I said, most administrators are. They don't do anything because they don't understand what it is they're supposed to do. They're faced with a situation which has co correctly been described here and in a panel earlier. And that's a situation uh, where what I and others call a regime of virtue has replaced a regime of deliberation. The regime of deliberation of any number of matters in the physical sciences, social sciences, and humanities is what the university is about. The university should not be a regime of virtue, either spearheaded by students or by faculty and, God forbid, uh, by senior administrations. It's up to senior administrations, as I said at the end uh, of my uh, little talk this, today, it's up to senior administrators to understand what their job is and to do it. Years ago, I came up with a three-part mantra uh, for faculty members and, and administrators. Do your job. Don't try to do anyone else's job. Don't let anyone else do your job. If you just stick to that and, re and realize that when a student, uh, when, when, um, when a student says something 
um, in a, uh, let's say, in a court uh, or in, an, uh, in a situation uh, where there's been a, a, a university uh, uh, workshop. Uh, there is no issue. There is no issue. It's not a free speech issue. If the student says things which lead to the kind of disruption uh, that we used to handle under the category of fighting words uh, uh, or uh, other uh, um, important uh, cases, if it's going to lead imminently to violence, to, have, to, to cite the Brandenburg uh, rule, if it's going to lead imminently to violence, then the administration steps in. If not, hands off. Don't do anything. And when someone in the university tries to stop the student or punish the student, the administrator should in fact rebuke that someone. Uh, Henry Beenan was the uh, president of Northwestern University uh, some years ago, and he had a deal uh, with the fact of a professor of electrical engineering by the name of Butts. Uh, professor Butts was also an ardent Holocaust denier. Uh, and there was a petition by members of the Northwestern faculty on the Northwestern University server asking the president to do something about Professor Butts. The president quite correctly said, Professor Butts is teaching electrical engineering. What he says as a citizen is, of course, his right, but you asked for his removal or discipline on a university server, therefore, I'm going to discipline you. And that was right, too. We need more administrators like that, by which, of course, I mean more administrators like me. <laughs> <laughs> To kind of play off that, I think incentives matter a lot. I mean, we saw when um, Secretary DeVos rewrote the Title IX rules, she reined it in because before the Obama rules encouraged through not even rules, their uh, you know their notice of their rulemaking, oh, their letter. silly dear letter, colleague yeah, colleague. the dear colleague letter. Yeah. It encouraged schools to violate students' First Amendment rights, um, and schools made that they made a very rational calculus that I pay, I pay less blowback for Title IX or for for a First Amendment problem than I do for a Title IX problem. And so I think the incentives matter. Um, when we sued a university that I can't name, because um, anyway, uh, we got on the phone with the general counsel the next day, and he said, I didn't appreciate learning about, my law about this lawsuit from the Wall Street Journal. I would have appreciated a heads up. Put the phone on mute. I said, you're going to hate Tucker Carlson tonight. I want general counsels to wake up screaming into the night that we are coming for them, because they think it is OK for them to violate students' First Amendment rights. And they need to know that it is not OK. Um, I think alumni giving plays a big factor in this. I really, I urge all of you, go look on FIRE's website, figure out what your alma mater is doing. Do not give them money. All of these, I mean, Harvard, Yale, like they have like these multi-billion dollar endowments. They don't need your money. Give it directly to a student group, give it directly to somebody else, but do not give it to your university. And when they call you, tell them you are not giving it to them for this purpose. That will make a difference. And no, like I don't give it, I didn't give enough money to the University of Illinois to make them like care a lot. But if there were 100 of us, 1,000 of us, then it starts to make them think, and they will start to make different decisions. And I think this is a really underutilized part of that. Um, I do think also another you know, possibility is, I saw years ago at um, a Pellerin meeting, Jonathan Haidt predict basically a coming split in academia, that there would be Pursuit of Truth University and Social Justice University. And I think, unfortunately, right now, we have a lot of universities that are trying to be both, and they're trying to be too cute about it. Um, if you are going to be Social Justice University, lean into it. There is a market for that. Um, but it is the bait and switch where you, you go to Yale and you think that you are going to be able to pursue intellectual diversity and truth and all these things, and you are not given that opportunity. That's where I think we have real problems. But if you're going to be a social justice university, don't call yourself a university. You don't deserve the name. <laughs> Fair. Mike, anything to add? I think we should go to the questions. Okay. <laughs> one, one postscript um, on this, this whole affair. One would think, by the way, I was talking about this protest situation, that it made me upset. Um, look, I have life tenure. Um, it really, it was a drop in the bucket. I called my wife later that day, and she's like, are you upset? That was outrageous. I said, not really. Um, and, and we talked about it, and she said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I told the Duke Federalist Society and the Career Services Office that I'd be willing to come back next week. Um, and unfortunately, they're a little, they were a little tired after my protest, so they decided that maybe next semester or the next year would be better. Um, but it just it kind of did make me sad, because I think that people are not open to hearing ideas with which they disagree. 
Um, and I think that's a problem. I think that we need to be open-minded and we need to hear each other. Uh, Justice Gorsuch talks about um, civility, right? That we need to be able to have a civil conversation with each other and air ideas. And I think that is absolutely as true today as ever in our country's history. So we will go to the, uh, to the front and then I see people lining up in the back. We'll switch off. Thank you, Judge. Um, I want to, sorry, I want to start by saying um, to Nicole Neely, I, I think you're awesome. I really support your work. Your husband's a really lucky guy. You know? um, also, I'm not sure if you're picking up the kids from school today or I am, but you will work that out. Anyway, <laughs> my question is for Professor Fish. If I understood you correctly, your position was that a student in a public university classroom has no free speech rights. That's right. Um, so I, I want to explore that with a hypothetical uh, with this Professor Butts. Um, whose first name I hope was Seymour. <laughs> Good Simpsons reference there. Um, so imagine that on the last day of class in a public university, Professor Butts says to the students, um, in order to not get an F from me, I need everybody to stand up right now and profess their belief that the Holocaust never happened. Uh, that's compelled speech, and that's a core part of First Amendment doctrine um, does your position entail that, that that professor at a public university could insist upon the profession of that belief as a condition? No, my position that is that that professor be fired within 20 seconds uh, because he's no longer acting as an academic. That's always my test. Are your actions and your decisions based on educational, pedagogical, academic um, uh, reasons? Uh, if that happened in a classroom, uh, there would be uh, the moment when the when the professor said that, he would cease being an academic and he would become a political agent. As a political agent, he enjoys no academic freedom whatsoever. His remarks are illegitimate. He can, in my opinion, be fired for them. The students would not be in any way obligated to hearken to a teacher who is no longer acting as their teacher. But that's not my question. My question is, if the feckless administration that you've told us about fails to act, the students have no recourse when that professor flunks them? No, uh, you're, that, thank you for sharpening, uh, that is for reminding me of the sharpness of your question. When I say students have no First Amendment rights, I should have qualified by saying except one, and it's an important one, the right to competent instruction. And competent may be too weak a word, because in my understanding, it includes not only mastery of the materials uh, in the course and the ability to organize the syllabus and to make assignments and to hand back assignments and all the rest. Competent also means knowing what the boundaries and obligations of the job is. So that someone, someone who, uh, someone who acted as 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 the instructor um, in uh, in your hypothetical, would no longer be a competent instructor. And students would have every right to go to the university, and there are committees, of course, in most universities which handle uh, these matters, and complain. And complain that they were no longer being instructed by a competent person, but by a political agent masking as an educator. Uh, I, have no, 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 I have no patience uh, whatsoever. Uh, with uh, anyone uh, like uh, acting in the manner uh, that your hypothetical uh, suggests, and I wouldn't even allow casual. In other words, if after the day of an election, your students ask you what you thought and how you voted, you had better say nothing. And say nothing not only in class, but after class and forever. All right, let's go to the back of the room. Thank you, Your Honor. Frank Shepard from uh, Miami, Florida. Um, I'll say that this is about the only form in which I do not feel intimidated, so thank you for allowing me to ask a question. Um, so this is the second panel today that I've attended where the internet has come up and the, uh, nobody had the answer about what to do. So my question is, let's do no harm. Why not let's do nothing? If you look a little bit of history, and I'm not a historian, but think a little bit, we, start, we once had canals to push things back and forth, and after a while they were replaced by steamboats, and after that 
we had automobiles, and after that we had jets and things like that, and the oil companies, I guess, may have been pressed to, uh, you know, the, the robber barons, for whatever reason, including some legal ones, I guess, went away. But the internet, this fellow, you know, was invented only 25 years ago. We all know that, so we know who did it. So my question is, it seems to me that 25 years is not very long. My question is, why should we not just let it go? Maybe another parlor or whoever they are, I don't watch these things, but somebody will come along. Thank you. So why not let it go? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Um, Anyone? No, go ahead. Well, uh, Mike? I would say that we have uh, our antitrust laws on the books, and if you don't want to enforce our antitrust laws, then you should, you should take them off the books. Uh, we, we don't have immigration am amnesty in this country, or we, we, we shouldn't have immigration amnesty in this country. Um, we shouldn't have amnesty for any law. You, you either have a law that is, uh, that is enacted through Congress by your elected representatives and it's enforced by the executive branch, or if you're gonna ignore the law, if you're gonna grant amnesty to the law, you're not, number one, the executive branch is not doing its constitutional duty, which is to faithfully enforce the law. But if you're not going to enforce the laws, take it off the books. Um, so if, 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 we, if we've come to a conclusion that having monopolies uh, use their market power to harm competition is not a problem, um, then I, we need to repeal the Sherman Act and we need to repeal the Clayton Act. But in the meantime, uh, uh, it's still the law and we need to enforce the laws. Um, let me just add to it. I watched that program uh, this morning um, <clears throat> about the uh, internet, and there were uh, some of the uh, participants did take a point of view. It wasn't so clear that there were um, antitrust violations or that they were so apparent. Said I don't teach or know that area. Shame to say, but um, so I think in a sense um, there was a lot of sort of con conclusory conclusory allegations about whether uh, these are um, clear anti-tech. Um, antitrust uh, violations, but I like the idea of first do no harm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor uh, Akhil Amar spoke at that program, and uh, he pointed out something. I just fun facts that the top five countries uh, companies in America today by by uh, um, f gross amounts earned are the are the tech companies, Google and all of them. The top five, none of them was around 50 years ago. Fifty years ago, the top five country, uh, companies are not around today. Um, so again, uh, if you if you follow uh, the Hippocratic oath and advice, um, maybe it might, maybe it might work out in the next fifty years. Who knows? All right, I want to get to as many questions as we can to the front of the room. Hi, I'm Bob Popper. I'm from Judicial Watch, and uh, we learned through public records requests that the Secretary of State of Iowa's office contacted Twitter to ask them to remove content from Judicial Watch, and we've learned that the Secretary of State of California's office contacted uh, YouTube and had them remove content from Tom Fitton, our president. And in the case of Iowa, this was many months before the election, and it had to do with discussion of cleaning the voter rolls. Uh, you've alluded to it, I believe, uh, that kind of a, a lawsuit where the First Amendment claim derives from contacts to the big tech companies. I was just wondering if you could comment about that kind of lawsuit and that kind of claim. All right, that's in my circuit, so I've got to steer clear of that one. Uh, well, I've pointed out that I, I think I was following up on something someone else had said, that the allegations of collusion uh, between government and private uh, turn the, any private activity into government activity, or at least uh, under um, state action doctrine as the court has espoused it. And so if indeed I would think the government calls up a private company and says censor these people, that you, the claim is it is as though the government were censoring these people and that triggers all of the First Amendment work. And since you're dealing uh, with uh, state officials, they're subject to suit under the Civil Rights Act, Section 1983, with, as I said earlier, attorney's fees available if you win that case under Section 1988. And if enough of those, again, assuming the, there's a valid basis for the suit, that the allegations are credible um, uh, and not frivolous, 
wow, can you imagine half a dozen of those suits against secretaries of state, of the states, for doing stuff like that? I think it would dry that up pretty quickly. Anyone else want to comment? All right, we will go back to the back of the room. Hi, uh, Casey Maddox. So I, I'm going to go back to the, to the campus context. Um, because we, we had some conversation, I think, about the, the sort of fecklessness of administrators. Um, and it, but I think a lot of the focus in the campus context, so I've, I've sued a whole lot of universities over violating the free speech rights of students and faculty members. But a whole lot of the conversation tends to be about individual incidents and how administrators responded to those incidents. And I think, as Nikki pointed out, when the reality is you've got written policies that general counsel supposedly has reviewed they continue to be just clearly unconstitutional written policies. The sort of, you know, no one can speak within, uh, outside of a 30-foot radius of a particular rock uh, on a campus, and those kinds of just ridiculous anti-speech policies. Um, I want to propose one possible reason for the fecklessness of administrators, uh, in addition to what's been mentioned before, and it's the existence of qualified immunity in the campus context. Justice, um, Justice Thomas, pointed out in his dissent from denial in the Hoggard case over the summer, that whatever one thinks about qualified immunity more broadly, uh, and I'm opposed to qualified immunity more broadly, but whatever you think about qualified immunity in the policing context, in the campus context, uh, there's, there is no split second decision making. These are people who are making determinations about speech policies that are written down, that are evaluated, uh, then published out to students that violate the First Amendment, and we should not be giving qualified immunity to administrators who are making deliberate decisions to violate free speech rights. Curious to your thoughts. Yeah, that is one that uh, we could do our own panel on, but I'm curious to hear what anyone has to say on that. Professor Fish. I know that people feel that marking off a small area and identifying it as a free speech zone is in some case a violation. Uh, of, of free speech rights and a dereliction on the duty, of duty on the part of the university. I think exactly the reverse. Because to follow through that line of thought is to believe, as I know some do, that the entire university should be a free speech zone, which is to make the mistake that I attempted uh, to analyze in my remarks earlier, a thinking of the university is in the free speech business. If we go back to Tinker v. Des Moines, a decision which had two parts to it. The first part said, and by the way, this is something that Justice Thomas rejected, and I kind of agree with him, but the first part of the decision said, students don't lose their free speech rights when they enter the schoolyard door. The second part, however, said, those free speech rights can be counterweighted. <coughs> <coughs> or dare I say it, trumped uh, uh, by the interest of the organization in having its daily business, its appropriate line of work facilitated uh, without disruption. Free speech zones are there so that there can be on the campus something like a Hyde Park corner. And remember, in a Hyde Park corner, People get up serially and say anything that they would like to say on any topic that comes into their heads. The only requirement is that they give up the soapbox after a while and let someone else do the same. The audience's obligation is not to take anything said seriously. That's what a free speech zone is. It's for spouting off. Spouting off is something that you might, as an administrator, want to give your students a room to do in. But it is not the business of the university. Spouting off is antithetical to education. It's antithetical to the attempt to search out the truth about difficult problems and issues in the humanities, physical sciences, and social sciences. So once again, Free speech is not the business the university is in or should be in. Can I just add? Sure. Um, uh, this is sort of the CLE part of the program. Um, the Supreme Court has been much more generous about free speech protections 
where colleges and universities and uh, graduate schools are concerned than K through 12. Um, the free speech rules in K through 12 uh, the Supreme Court has been much less generous. As Professor Fish pointed out, the sort of um, landmark decision in 1969 in the Tinker case, which said students in public schools have free speech rights, also put some limitations on them uh, that were the students at, in a college or university, I don't think the Supreme Court would have allowed. So the free speech rights recognized at the college and university level are closer to the rights you have out on the street, so to speak, um, there, there are some limitations in terms of, of classroom requirements and things like that, uh, but, but generally the court has drawn a sharp divide between the free speech rights K through 12 and the um, free speech rights of the grown-ups basically at colleges and universities, so where they're, they're public institutions. Um, one final point, um, it's sort of uh, interesting, I guess, uh, Tinker, 1969, uh, but then for 50 years plus, the Supreme Court had a handful of cases involving high school students like Tinker, and in none of them did it rule in favor of the students. It found one way or another to kind of um, take an off-ramp. Uh, either it, it involved a curriculum matter, or it involved vulgar speech at, a, at an assembly, or it involved uh, advocating a drug use or something that the school could prohibit. Right. And it wasn't until this a couple months ago um, in the case out of Pennsylvania that the Supreme Court, after 52 years, uh, granted a First Amendment right claim of a student uh, who said some, used a four-letter word to express to her friends on social media her disappointment at not being chosen for the cheerleader squad and came to the school's attention and they disciplined her. And the Supreme Court upheld her free speech right to have made those statements. But the opinion is written by Justice Breyer and it is I tell my students a typical Justice Breyer opinion has about four factors and three conditions. Uh, <laughs> put them all together and you get the rule, but it's a very contingent, ad hoc kind of rule. Yeah, limited, very limited. Uh, and Yes, and it really, it, it's hard to, to, if you're trying to advise a student if they can say something or not, or advise a, a high school administrator whether they can punish the student for saying something or not, uh, don't get uh, uh, too much uh, solace from this decision, but it is the first time in 52 years they've upheld the free speech rights of high school students. So there is at least that. What is happening in this history is a question of deference. What, to what extent does the court pay deference to different institutions? And as you all know, this question is raised in the context not only of universities, but also of churches and other religious institutions, where the general rule is we, the courts, don't know what goes on um, in the heart, at the heart of doctrinal tenants uh, or in the organization and administration of churches, so we're going to keep our hands off. That used to be also an attitude that the courts took toward uh, colleges and universities, uh, uh, more or less saying, well, these academics are smart people. They must know what they're doing. They must have not spent that much time in, in, in English departments. Uh, they, they must know what they're doing. Therefore, we're not going to interfere. But that, that, that stopped about 25 years ago. And right. more and more areas of, of the university, from employment to promotion uh, to retention, even to people who believe that they've been assigned an inferior office, um, have, uh, which is everybody, um, uh, have now become uh, part of litigation where they wouldn't have been before. Ms. Neely, I think you wanted to say something yeah, about this I, I topic. Kind of, I feel like it was a little bit of a microaggression for Casey to ask me about qualified immunity, given what my husband does. But um, I do think that, in, again, incentives matter. We see universities trying to do so many things and govern all aspects of student lives that I think general counsels, like, they really, I think in some cases, they don't know what's going on. The bias response team, the Title IX department puts up some crazy wording in their language. They don't know because they're trying to pay attention to a zillion other things. I mean, when we sued University of Illinois, they said, if you are on spring break and you break a window, that falls under our jurisdiction. University of Michigan said, anything in the city of Ann Arbor falls under our jurisdiction. Like, these are powers that local police forces don't give themselves, that universities give themselves. And so I think, you know, the lawsuits matter. And I, and I do think that going after QI is important because it will focus the mind and it will focus the attention. All right, that has to be the last word, unfortunately. We gotta keep the trains running on time. I always wanna get to all the other questions, and I feel bad because our questioner has been waiting a while, but I do have to give you a, we got through a few, I have to give you our public service announcement of the day. 
um, which is at the conclusion of this panel, I'm supposed to say that the next event is the Barbara K. Olson Memorial Lecture, which will begin at 5 p.m., which is now 29 minutes, not 30, so I might get in trouble after the close of this panel in the Grand Ballroom. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening to what our panelists had to say, and thank you to our panelists for enlightening us on this topic.